This is the Horse Radio Network. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here is your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Well, good morning, everybody. I am Glenn the Geek in Ocala, Florida. And I am Allison Renborg in beautiful Lebanon, Tennessee. And you are listening to the monthly Equine Affair episode of Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for November 17th, episode 3062. This episode is brought to you by Equine Affair. Good morning, horse people. It's the third Thursday of the month. That means it's time for the Equine Affair episode, North America's premier equine expo and equestrian gathering. Well, and you just had that premier equine expo and gathering in Massachusetts. Are you recovered yet? Well, no, Glenn, of course not. Like, <laughs> yes, I, I was able to catch up on a little bit of sleep on Tuesday. Um, I got Tuesday off and, uh, that was wonderful. And then, yeah, just like, but I'm still crashing into bed every night, like pretty, pretty tired. <laughs> How much coffee is consumed by you and the staff during, uh, this event? Oh my gosh, Glenn. So, Personally, I love Massachusetts because it's the land of Dunkin' Donuts. It is, yes, every corner. Literally uh, four corners on every intersection have Dunkin' Donuts on them. Yes, so there was a Dunkin' right next to my hotel, which I did not get to like enjoy. But there's also a Dunkin' on the grounds in the Better Living Center at the ESE. And then there's, I think, another Dunkin' vendor in a different building. So Dunkin' is like right there. Um, so Dunkin' is my coffee of choice. The rest of the staff are more into Starbucks. So they would do Starbucks runs on their way in. And I would wait and get Dunkin' when I was there. Um, so a lot of coffee was drunk. Um, I am inclined to take my own personal like Keurig and espresso machine uh, to Ohio because I drive to that one uh, so that we can have espresso because it was a huge tragedy. The espresso machine was broken at Duncan oh, no. the entire time. So I could not get a turbo shot to save my life. Uh, so a lot is the answer, a very scientific answer, a lot of coffee. Like I want to say... For me, I drink one little one in the morning at the hotel. You got to have that like, you know, coffee with your breakfast. And then I'd probably have two or three medium iced coffees throughout the day. So that's a lot of coffee. Something you had to get you going, keep you going. (laughs) Yeah. You know, they're long days. I mean, I don't think that the... Uh, that people really realize how early we get there and how late we stay. So it's easily a few 14 hour days in there. So you got to have coffee. I mean, well, Fantasia is not over till late too. Right. Exactly. Yep. Well, today we're going to talk about all things equine affair, including we're going to kind of recap the event. And uh, Allison did a few interviews while she was there that she conducted on site. So we're going to share those with you. I love those. So thank you for doing that. Uh, and, you know, we're just going to kind of do a wrap up. And then next month, we'll start looking forward to the next one, which is in April in Ohio, which I hope to make that one. I'm, I'm really hoping I can make that one. Yes. So tell us, was a, were the crowds good? You know, was everybody excited? Was it, uh, were, were there happy times and were there lots of shopping bags? Uh, yes. And yes. And yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it went great. Um, Massachusetts weather is always chancy and that affects whether people want to come out because, you know, we're spread out over multiple buildings. You have to walk outside to get from building to building. And so if it's raining and sleeting and freezing rain, you know, really the diehards don't care, but some people care. Uh, but anyway, we had gorgeous weather. Thursday was the most beautiful day I've been able to spend outside in a while. Um, and then we had a few monsoon moments, but then it would clear up and it was just fate was really on our side with the weather. So we had lots of great crowds. Um, it, it's always my favorite moment. I'm usually in the show office in the very beginning of the day and I'm like on the computer, you know, gearing up our social media, whatever. And, and I can start hearing the crowds humming 
as they come in like that. That's kind of exciting. It's a little bit like when you're behind the curtains at, at a play when you're in a play in high school and you can hear the crowd out there and you get kind of like butterflies in your stomach, but also happy. Uh, so, um, but all reports were really great. I'm thinking I heard unofficially cause we haven't had our like official post event meeting, but I did hear that our numbers were as good as, or even better than last year in 2021, oh, well, which well, that's really good. Cause that was a makeup yeah. year from all of the uh, COVID stuff. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So we're just really grateful every year. Our team is super grateful for the support that horse lovers come out, that they want to come out in whatever the weather um, and enjoy this event with us. Because I mean, we can all show up and do the job, but like if nobody comes, it's not North America's premier equine expo and equestrian gathering, right? <laughs> we got to have the equestrians to gather. So you guys really came through and came and we're just so glad. Well, that's terrific. I'm glad to hear that. So how did Fantasia go? Oh, Fantasia was fabulous. So <clears throat> Thursday night, I was in the box office and then uh, I got to see a few minutes and then I went home. Uh, but Friday and Saturday, I was there. I was in the box office and then I went out and got to film because we like to film it internally for Equine Affair. And um, that's an, a spectacular view from the press box. Um, the crowds were wonderful. We sold out for Friday. We sold out for Saturday um, fairly early. And when I was in the box office each night, I always had, I always feel terrible. People would come up and say, you're really sold out? And I'd be like, yes, I am really sold out. And they would ask me three or four times. And I'm like, no, I'm not kidding. I mean it. (laughs) So that's just a little side note for you guys for the future. If you want to come to Fantasia, don't wait until the day of because we sell out. And then that's it. Like, you got to wait till next year. Um but the show itself was so good. Um, our listeners might remember we interviewed Elliot Holtzman. You remember that, Glenn? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so his beautiful Aladdin and Jasmine performance was wonderful. Um, let's see. We had the Canadian cowgirls there and they are very popular, uh, in Canada, I assume, as well as in the United States. Uh, <laughs> the people love them and they do yeah, this I've fabulous. Actually- I've met them a few times in, yeah. uh, when they've done shows here, and we've interviewed them in the past, and they're they're a very bubbly bunch, too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you you kind of have to be to do drill, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always amazed because one of their routines was really, really long, um, just comparatively for it, an act and performance. It went on for quite a while, and like they're just as full of energy at the end as they are at the beginning. Yep. <laughs> I'm like... That's true. How much coffee fuels that team? (laughs) That's right. That's what I want to know. And then, of course, the... uh, So, are you watching... Have you watched Stranger Things? Yeah, the first year and a half. I didn't... (laughs) After that, it got to... I I couldn't do it anymore. Well, okay. So, the most recent season, you probably heard about this on the news, but Kate Bush is running up that hill from, like, the 80s has experienced a resurgence because they used it in the most recent season. Have you heard that? No, no. Okay. Well, it's become extremely popular again. Um, All the kids are listening to it. Um, And so Jane Carroll, who was our dressage presenter and who's an amazing uh, dressage practitioner, performed a a Stranger Things freestyle to that song. And that was extremely popular, as you can imagine. (laughs) So that was pretty cool. Uh, and then the Icelandics were there. Uh, of course, we interviewed, you and I interviewed Laura, uh, a little bit ago. Um, I want to say, was it last episode? Yeah, that was a, I remember talking about the Icelandics. Yes. It was a lifetime ago for me. I think it was last month. Um, and so they did a killer job. You know, there was fire, um, <laughs> singing, lots of lights, lots of speed, lots of rock and roll. Everybody loves that. Um, it, it was probably my personal favorite act. Very cool. Yeah. I heard a rumor Uh-oh. that there might have been a loose horse at some point. Now, you cannot have a show anywhere in America without a loose horse. So, I mean, this is just standard. <laughs> you know where it really gets bad, though, is we've been to carriage competitions where the horse gets loose in the carriage. It's still attached. That's dangerous because they bounce off cars. Yeah. It's just it, – it breaks a lot of things. Yeah. So, th- this one was not attached to a carriage from what I heard. 
No, no, this was a, a horse in the Liberty competition. Uh, I think this was Sunday morning. Uh, and so, you know, that's the call on the radio you never really want to hear is loose horse on the grounds. And then everybody, of course, jumps up and we're in action because we know what we're going to do, right? We've been through this before. Our staff are really seasoned as you have to be. If you run a horse event, you're going to have a loose horse. Um, and so from what I hear, the horse entered the arena and then decided he was done. He was just done. And uh, he took a spectacular flying leap over the arena wall. And are we our... sure this wasn't part of the act? <laughs> well. <laughs> it is liberty. He wanted a, he really wanted a candied apple or a cotton candy or something. A funnel well, cake. He wanted a funnel cake. That's right. I mean, it might have been near lunchtime, honestly. So <laughs> I'd buy that. Um, he took a spectacular flying leap. Our photographer was there, as was our videographer. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get it on video. I think he was shooting something else going on at the same time. But our photographer got a shot. And the horse is sailing in midair. And one of our brave, brave volunteers was uh, in the act of trying to close the gate. And so uh, she was proudly displaying the picture to me later of her face looking up at the horse that looks like he's coming down on top of her. Of course, he he was not. It was just the angle, you know. Um, so she has he the worst he, story for life. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, one of our wonderful staff members, Craig McCoskery, uh, caught the horse fairly quickly. I want to say within seconds. No one was hurt. No horses were hurt. No people were hurt. A uh, horse was caught, returned to his person, and we went on with the show because the show must go on. So it was a very happy story. Oh, that's good. He didn't end up yeah. running down the halls and into the parking lot. And no. That's what usually happens. <laughs> right, right. No, no, none of that. We got the horse caught and returned home. Everything was good. All right, good. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear it. And I, you know, we got to talk to some listeners. I had, what do we have, six hosts there? I think it's the most mm -hmm. HRN hosts that have been in any one location ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yep. And I got to talk to some listeners on the show, and they were all having a good time. And I know I talked to Mandy a couple times over there uh, at her lead line booth. And yes. she kept saying she was seeing listeners there the whole time. So uh, so that's pretty cool. I'm glad that uh, – and I, now it makes sense because Mandy seemed hopped up the whole time. <laughs> She was in that the place where where the where the Dunkin' Donuts was, so well, that makes and, sense now. And I will say, when I stopped by her booth, I want to say on Sunday, she and Tim had Dunkin' Donuts on their <laughs> table. They were in full, you know, Dunkin' flow. Um, she had a gorgeous booth. So any of your listeners who saw that, it it stood out to me. Um, just perfect, beautiful, elegant, simple, simple, but like. Perfect. And, and I that's think she, Mandy right there. That just yeah. describes her. Yeah. Well, that's true. So her ears are probably burning. But uh, <laughs> I think she did a ton of interviews, too. Every time I saw anything on Facebook from Mandy, it was an interview. Um, so pretty cool. Yeah, she had the whole podcasting set up there. Yeah. Um, you know, all set up and ready to go. I know because the day before she left, she's like, I don't know how to use this recorder. So I had to you know, <laughs> well, actually figure out how to record. <laughs> well, what's funny is I think that she had the same mic set up that I had actually just gotten for my interviews. And um, then one of our presenters, the natural vet and his assistant, who was also presenting with him, Holly, um, they had just gotten the exact same mic set. So between me and Mandy, we were helping them get their mics set up before their presentations. <laughs> so like they had borrowed a cord from Mandy and then they were coming to me because someone had sent them to me and I was like hooking them up to my laptop and getting the software updated and all that stuff. So like we were we were working your horse radio network people were uh, troubleshooting for others. So we, we all collaborate. We, we got it done and we got them set up, but they big kudos to Mandy for lending out her equipment. Um, <laughs> Cause that's dangerous. You lend it out. It may never come back, but <laughs> she's, she's a good egg. Really like she Mandy. is. By the way, if yes. you want to hear her show, it's the lead line podcast and it's also on the horse radio network as well. But you know what? There's another expo coming. And if you missed the, this one, if you're, you have a little bit of envy right now and you didn't get to spend all your money on your credit card, uh, you can. <laughs> and by the way, I saw pictures. People were taking pictures. There were a lot of bags walking around. <laughs> um, so in 2023, there's going to be two. There's going to be Columbus, Ohio, and that's April 13th to the 16th, which is always 
right before Kentucky. It's always right before Land Rover. Um, so April 13th through the 16th, and that's handy for vendors because they usually go from right from you down to Land Rover. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's at the Ohio Expo Center in, uh, and in Columbus. And then also in West Springfield, Massachusetts, November 9th through the 12th again. And that will be up where you just were at the Eastern States Exposition. So you can find all the details on those at equineaffair.com. And I'm hoping, well, we're going to have to make sure I get up to Ohio. That's, we're going to make sure that happens. Oh, now, yeah. you did an interview. Talk to us about uh, the first interview you did. I would love to. I did, I think, 13 or 14 interviews, but oh, wow, I picked good. I picked two for today. So <laughs> our first interview is with Franny Galvin Hines, and she was the winner of the 2022 Massachusetts Versatile Horse and Rider Competition. Um, I think maybe our last episode or the episode before that, we talked to Danelle Ossinchuk and we were sort of hyping the competition to you guys. Um, it happened. It was wonderful. And Franny came out on top. Uh, she and her horse Supernova were the winners. And so just to tell you a little bit about Franny, um, before she talks about her win, um, Franny has been riding since she could walk. She's been training horses since she was 12 and she is a multiple championship winner in all sorts of things, including competitive trail and show jumping and ranch work. So well set up for competing in a versatility competition. And then Nova, her horse, or rather Supernova, is a six-year-old Fjord quarter horse cross who came to Franny as a yearling. And we're actually going to hear the story of how Franny rescued Supernova and then trained her and raised her and brought her up and rode her at the competition. So Tune in to this great interview that we conducted on site at Equine Affair in Massachusetts with Franny. My name is Franny Galvin Hines, and I come from a small little town in Ontario called Bethany. And I was here for the Massachusetts Versatile Horse and Rider Challenge. Yes. And tell us about the two horses that you rode and how you did on each of them. So the first horse that I rode was Nova or Supernova. And I have had her since she was one years old, and this was my second time competing in the Versatile Horse and Rider Challenge. And I was so proud of her. I ran second in the arena, so I did not get to see really anybody go at all. But she did everything I asked, and the only errors were my fault. She did exactly what I wanted, so I can't complain. And yeah, and my second horse is Aspen's Wild Grove, or Aspen. I also got him when he was a yearling for the Mustang Tip Challenge in Georgia, and I let him grow up. I just started him this year. I didn't even know I was doing the challenge with him until about two weeks prior, and he got 10th place, and I was so, so very proud of him. So tell us, how how did you prepare for the challenge with Supernova? So with Supernova, I do the sport of extreme cowboy racing. And it's very similar to the versatile horse and rider. So I competed all year, basically a show every weekend, if not two on one weekend or every other weekend. And I went everywhere. I went five hours away, two hours away, and I practiced and I practiced and I listened to her. Like before I go into the arena, I usually let her eat grass and she's happier that way. She competes better when we're relaxed. So I kept it chill and uh, yeah, she was awesome. What was the obstacle that you felt like you handled the best on Nova yesterday? Oh, the obstacle I handled the best. Oh, man, honestly, I was super proud of her for all of them. The counter canner, she did it the moment I asked. The roping, she stood perfectly. The the weave, she cantered the whole thing. The, the spear, <laughs> even though I didn't get the ring right away, she stood like a champ. Jumping, she's a really good girl at that stuff, honestly. I don't know, I can't pick one. Yeah. She was perfect in my eyes. <laughs> How did you feel when you rode out with her after you guys were done? Did you think, I think I did really well? Did you feel like you didn't? What, what was your overall impression? I was very proud of her, and I always set my goals really realistically. I was like, I don't care if you did got dead last, in my heart, you did your best, and I couldn't have changed anything to make it better. So did I think I did as well as I did? No. Um, <laughs> am I incredibly proud of her, and my goal was top five? Yes. <laughs> yeah. and so how did it feel when you won and you found that out? 
So, my friend has a video of the ribbons being announced, and when they announced second place, my two friends that I had met through the versatile horse and rider started looking at me, and they're like, I think you did it, I think you did it. I'm like, no, no, not till they say my name, I'm not getting my hopes up. And when they said my name, like my heart was racing and I started crying and I hugged Nova and I was so proud of her. Oh my gosh, you're so proud. I'm so I proud love of her. This. this is great. So how, um, how are you planning to celebrate with Nova? She got a big apple and a big carrot and I put her special blanket on and her boots and she went for a walk and I gave her a big hug. <laughs> and then she just got to hang out and we went and celebrated with some cupcakes. And this morning I went and saw her and I gave her a big hug and a kiss and I told her how much I loved her. So she didn't, she's just like, okay, mom, I love you too. Like she doesn't, she doesn't get it. But. So what are your future plans with her? Do you want to do this competition again? My plans with Supernova, I plan to keep her until her last breath. She's not going anywhere. But I plan to go to Texas. I want to keep doing my sport of extreme cowboy racing. I would love to keep competing with her. Maybe one day I'll breed her, but I know there's a lot of complications with that and the thought of losing her. I couldn't do that. I couldn't lose her. So competing, loving her. I love doing Liberty work with her. She knows so many different tricks. And like, I love riding bridalists and honestly enjoying her. I just love to be with her. And then you told me earlier that there's a special story that you rescued her. So do you want to kind of talk about how you met Nova and how that all went down? I would love to. It's okay. a really clever one. All right. So I was at a clinic probably roughly two hours from where I live in Ontario. And I brought a three horse trailer with only two horses on it. And actually a friend of mine tagged me and I have fjord horses. so. I have a bit of a soft spot for them. And they're like, oh my goodness, Franny, there's this cute little fjord cross. She's at this rescue just 20 minutes away. I was like, oh man, okay. So I went to look at her and man, she was just a little ball of fluff. And I like just something about her. I just had to take her. So I took her home and like best rescue ever. I let her grow up. And when I got her from the rescue, it was exactly a month after she got there. And the story of her getting to the rescue is someone had bought her and another horse just as pasture mates when they were little and couldn't take care of them anymore. So they actually got surrendered slash given to the rescue. And yeah, I think it's so funny that I picked her up exactly a month after March 11th, best day of my life. <laughs> um, and yeah, I brought her home. I introduced her to my other fjords. She had a knack for obstacles. She picked up a rubber chicken and threw it around, so <laughs> she didn't care about much at all. Yeah. And yeah, in 2020, I started her. We got delayed because of everything that happened, but that didn't stop us. We stayed persistent. I kept working with her. Our first show year, we were maturity champion of Ontario. This is our second show year at surf champion of non-pro, so I couldn't be more proud of her. The horse nobody wanted. Yeah. And now everybody wants her. Now everybody wants her. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you have any advice to other young trainers like yourself um, who might want to compete with a rescue horse or come to the VHRC? What, would you, what advice would you give them? Listen to your horse. They will tell you when they're ready. If you see other people doing other things, don't think you're wrong. I sometimes look at other people riding and be like, man, should I be doing that? No, <laughs> what I'm doing is working just fine. Trust yourself and don't be afraid to ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign that you don't know what you're doing. You can only grow. And if someone gives you advice that you don't love or maybe doesn't work for you, pick something else. I've learned from hundreds of different clinicians and friends and just people with advice. It never hurts to listen. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It of was course. a pleasure to get to hear your story, and <laughs> congratulations on Thank you winning. for having me. Thank you. This is yeah. amazing. I'm so excited to go and join the Equine Affair. Yay! So, Allison, I know you guys are all, you guys are big supporters of veterans. And of course, Veterans Day, you know, was just, uh, just happened. And, and I heard that you did something for the veterans as well. We did. Um, so, of course, 
whenever Equine Affairs straddles Veterans Day, we we really like to stop and honor our veterans and those who served. And so we always do a special presentation at Fantasia that night. Usually our announcer has all the veterans stand up by their branch of the military. And actually, I think Noah, our announcer, did that each night of Fantasia, which I thought was really special. And of course, the Canadian Cowgirls did a a salute to the armed forces. And they talked a little bit about uh, Canada and America military working together. Um, But then on Friday, so actually Veterans Day, we had the Equine Immersion Project on. and, And our listeners will remember we had interviewed Tara with EIP um, a couple episodes ago. And so they held their Horses for Heroes activity Friday night. And there are some great pictures on their Facebook. They had a really good turnout. I want to say maybe 10 veterans uh, were able to interact with their horses and learn about the therapy that's associated with working with horses. And I think it made it a Veterans Day to remember for them. And I was really touched when I saw the photos after the fact. It was it was a great activity. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. For them. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that worked out. You know, uh, we've had we've interviewed so many people that are are doing now the veterans uh, therapy programs mm-hmm. across the country, and we've heard so many great stories about that. So, and there's more and more popping up all the time, which is good. I think it's it's wonderful support. Um, it's just a really special way that we can make horses uh, relevant to people from all walks of life and then actually help people mentally and emotionally and psychologically with the things that they've endured. Um, it's just it's really special. I think it's great. The more popular, the better, honestly. Well, and you did a terrific job. Allison is in charge of social media and they, on their Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And I was following all of that during the events. Uh, the handles, uh, at Equine Affair and you can get year round updates there and also the podcast, obviously. And we're going to keep doing this. So, uh, I just wanted to mention that you did a great job. So congratulations and well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely as anyone who's managed social media knows it can be, uh, the best part of your day or the worst part of your day, but we have wonderful fans and they, they're wonderful. So I love updating them and interacting with people and it, it's the best. It's, it's really a great job, but it's because of the people. Well, and the, the problem we're having in social media is there's not less platforms. There's more all the time. So. <laughs> yes. And, uh, I, I'll go ahead and make the announcement here. We are going to launch an equine affair TikTok. So. <laughs> That was decided during the event, so That's what yay! I done yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to get on TikTok, Glenn. I mean, if if I'm on there, you should be on there. <laughs> I kind of think you'll have more material than I will. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, great, and you can, of course, you can find Equine Affair. Just look for them on all of those social platforms. All right, let's talk about the second interview you did. Yes, so this one. Uh, more serious note, but uh, no less emotional. So uh, this next interview is with Kelly Stackpole, and she is the executive director of Rising Star Horse Rescue in Wilton, Connecticut. So Rising Star, and that's star with two R's on the end, saves, rehabilitates, retrains, and rehomes abandoned, neglected, or abused horses. And they also educate the public about at-risk horses and how we can protect them, and more importantly, prevent more at-risk horses from developing. Um, and so by giving America's horses a second chance at life, Rising Star gives the community the chance to experience the love patience and compassion that horses have for humans. So check out this really cool interview I did with Kelly. She'll also talk about the six adoptable horses that she brought to participate in the adoption affair in Massachusetts just this last week. Kelly, thank you for joining me here today. I really appreciate you coming by to talk about your rescue. So tell us a little bit about your rescue. What's the name of it? Uh, Where's it located? And what do you do there? So I'm Kelly Stackpole. I'm actually the founder and the executive director of Rising Star Horse Rescue. We're in Wilton, Connecticut. We started um, in the beginning of 2016, and we were going to rescue one horse at a time. (laughs) And that's greatly changed. We currently have 38 horses in our Wilton property. And um, in the next 
year to a year and a half, things take a little while, we are going to be having our own sanctuary in Virginia. Awesome. And so what are you hoping, do you already own the property in Virginia that you're hoping to have the sanctuary? We do. It was actually donated to us. Um, and part of what we do, what Rising Star does, is all of our horses have a safety net forever. We do retrain, rehabilitate, and adopt out. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes life happens to the very best homes, and we need to be able to back up. Those horses can come back to us. Some horses we get, and they're really just not adoptable um, for various reasons, whether it's trainability or usually non-rideable or just, you know, close to 40 years old. And, and to those homes are really hard to find. They're really hard to feed because they have to eat soup. Those kinds of horses, we need to be able to give them, you know, palliative care and give them the forever that they need. So, you know, we, we definitely change with the times. Our mission doesn't change, but how we have to stand by the horses, you know, with the way of the world definitely changes. And what is your mission? So our mission is to save America's at-risk horses. The way we do that is not just through rescuing the horses. We can't rescue 100,000 horses a year. And it's not even just about horses that go to slaughter. Um, there's many, many reasons horses need rescuing. We do a lot of work through education. Our volunteer program, five years old and up, Parents have to be with them <laughs> until they're 13. Um, we actually have volunteer coordinators. We have volunteers that are really, really seasoned horse people that train. This is all free. Um, two days during the week and both weekend days, we literally have people in that train volunteers. They're our biggest resource. I think they should be any rescue's biggest resource. With that comes a lot of liability and a lot of training. But for every person or child that we can teach them the plight of America's horses and how to be educated and make good choices for America's horses, and then they go share that, we really feel that that's gonna help more horses in the long run. So you're really working to save current at-risk horses, but then you're also trying to prevent at-risk horses from developing through education. Well, yeah, we would love to be put out of business. Yeah. You know, um, odds are even if the SAFE Act gets passed and horses don't ship to slaughter, just like any other animal, life happens and families for reasons out of their control. I mean, horses are going to need homes. They're going to need trainers people can't afford. Um, and we really do try and help people in that way. I mean, we take a lot of surrenders. And if we can, the more people we can train to really listen to horses and see what they want um, and see what the horses want, you know, the, the last horses we hope we see. Most of the horses that we get and that you see in bad situations is lack of training. It's, it's, they, they are, they are not trained. Um, everybody, oh, this horse has 30 days training. The difference between a green horse and a real rideable, well-trained horse is at least 1,800 hours in the saddle of good riding. Um, and they just, you know, that's a huge commitment. And again, so the more people we teach, we have older people come in and read to our wild Mustangs. That helps us trainers, um, really helps us do our job. So there's really something for everybody to do. Well, and I think it's so important for people to remember that the best thing you can do for a horse that you own or that you ride is make sure that they are trained. Give mm -hmm. them the tools that they need so that if they end up in a different home someday, they can be used and they can be ridden and they, they know what they're doing because it goes back to what you're saying about training. It's like if you let a green horse leave you, you're passing that responsibility on to someone else who might mm -hmm. not take it, right? Yeah. 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 I think that's really important. It's really important. You know, 
when somebody comes to look at one of our adoptable horses. Um, they have to be approved before they can get on the horse, handle the horse. Um, people laugh at me all the time. I list every horrible, terrible thing I can think of about this horse. If that's any of that is what they, they're like, well, I can't live with that. I'm like, well, we're not going to look at that horse. Because um, we're not selling a horse. Because if it goes to you and it's a problem, it's coming back to us. Um, so we really try to let people know really what they're getting. Yeah. And that's transparency. Really yes, transparency. Um, something I really want to say um, from some of the, the rescues we had to do this year is, you know, we're a 501c3, we're a non-for-profit. Um, I know a lot of people give to a lot of non-for-profits, whether it's cats, dogs, this or that. Um, I'm begging donors to know who they're giving their money to. Check with the IRS, check with GuideStar, make sure that they are transparent and your money is going to help the animals. That's another big issue, and it's not just us. We all, all us rescues, cats, dog, we all need to work together. And I think it's a really important message to tell all the donors out there to please know where your money is. You know, with Rising Star, you can come see it anytime. We are open seven days a week. Um, and if you don't know horses, we'll teach you horses. How can people donate or support your rescue since we're on that topic? So we have our website, risingstarhorserescue.org. We have a Facebook and we have an Instagram, Star is two R's. And, um, you know, we, we invite you to come cyberstalk us and follow us and follow our horses, donate, or come visit, come volunteer. And what are you hoping to accomplish by having the rescue here? What did you, and who did you bring with you? Uh, in terms of horses? So we brought six horses this year. Um, last year we brought two. And the most important thing, it's a great venue for people to see our rescue horses and to see rescue has a bad stigma attached, that they're not, nothing should be thrown away, but that they are, um, rescue horses can do anything that, expensive horses can do. Um, the visibility here is really nice. People come through the barn. They don't know that rescues are out there and what they do. Um, a big thing we find is a lot of people are like, oh, horses need to be rescued. Um, and there's all walks of life here. Um, you know, where our rescue is, it's mostly English. We get a lot of horses that would do a better job being a Western horse. The nice thing about Equine Affair is you literally have, you have people that want to do just groundwork. You've got the gypsy banners, you've got, you've got everything here. So, you know, odds are whatever horse we bring, there's people that might be interested in what that horse is probably best at for its second career. And Equine Affair allows us to showcase that. What do you love the most about Equine Affair or expos like this? What do you enjoy personally? Oh. Personally, mm -hmm. well, I love seeing a lot of people that I don't get to talk to every year. Um, and it is nice to, to bring the young horses and um, have them settled here for a few days. Even if they don't get adopted, it's such a great experience for the animals young and old that, that have had different lives, um, shopping. <laughs> and we actually need some saddles and a new trailer. So we will be looking for that. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things. Is there anything else you want to share or that we didn't cover that you think people should know? Um, you know, I, I really encourage everybody to look at the rescues in your area. Um, when you're looking for a horse and being realistic um, and see what's out there, you know, and take your time. Whether you're buying a horse, whether you're spending $1,000 or $100,000, take your time. They're a long, long commitment and know what you're looking for.
Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Been- thank you. Well, we mentioned that the next one is coming up in Ohio. What makes Ohio, what's different about Ohio from Massachusetts? Well, it's in Ohio. No. Um- <laughs> yeah, there's that. Uh, so there are some differences. I mean, overall, we try to bring the same spirit of the event, of course, um, to each event, but there are some differences. Um, in particular, we do a ride a horse event in Ohio that we actually did not get to do in Massachusetts this year. But when we do, it's usually ride a Morgan in Massachusetts because we're right next to Vermont mm-hmm. and, you know, the home um, of but. Morgans. Right. Um, all Morgans come from Vermont. Um, <laughs> in Columbus, we do ride a halflinger because the halflingers are really big in Columbus. Um, so that's kind of fun. Just those different breed uh, up close and personal. Uh, we also are doing a Mustang tip challenge so that trainers incentive program. Mm-h. Um, and that's real big, real popular. Um, the Mustang the challenge. Yeah. 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 Yes. And in fact, I think uh, the farm that we cooperate with is in Pikeville, Tennessee, which is just a stone's throw from me. So that's kind of cool. Um, but all the trainers come down to Pikeville, they pick up their horses, and then they have, I want to say it's 100 days before they come to Columbus to conduct the competition part um, and show off everything they've taught their horses over time. So that's a huge part of the event that we haven't done in Massachusetts. So if you're into Mustangs and Mustang training, Columbus is the place for you. Very cool. And I was just looking here at the Kentucky three day. So the Kentucky three day events, April 27th through the 30th. So it's the next week Ooh. Uh, after. So I think we're, Jennifer and I are just going to have to do a road trip. <laughs> yeah, and everybody save your vacation days. Just there have a go. have a two week horse vacation and make a you know make a trip out of it. Hit the cool places in Kentucky too. And and actually, Columbus and Lexington are not that far apart, really. Right. Yeah. Very cool. And yeah. I I remember going to Columbus. We we were there as vendors a couple of years with stores that were there. And I you know it's funny as I have more recollection of Massachusetts than I do. Ohio, and I think it's because there were more food choices in Massachusetts. Probably. <laughs> and as a horse husband, that's what I remember. <laughs> yes, the food was real good in Massachusetts. You, uh, it's the one thing about, you go to most expos, and there's no food selection. It's whatever, you know, crappy food they serve, like at a ball game, right? Sure. Um, but Massachusetts is really good food. So. I had a baked potato that, like... Like, I've had a lot of baked potatoes in my life, Glenn, and everybody was raving to me about the baked potato vendor in Massachusetts. And I was like, well, it can't be that good. Um, and so I spent $10 one night on a baked potato. A baked potato. Uh, and I was like, is this really worth $10? I don't know how they got it so fluffy. They cut it into it in front of me. They did nothing to the interior in front of me. Uh, but it was fluffy like all the way through. So I don't know what they did, but that was worth 10 bucks to me. I mean, <laughs> and then it was like $5 worth of sour cream on top. So, <laughs> That's um, what makes a potato good. <laughs> but you know, there's good food in Ohio too. It's just, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Very cool. Well, if you want to go to Ohio, check out uh, equineaffair.com. And I know that we have a lot of listeners over in Ohio Mm -hmm. in that area that will be uh, Michigan, especially. We have more listeners in Michigan than the other place. Wow. Um, So I know that they come down for that. Uh, So we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. We'll make sure we do some meetups and all that kind of thing. Uh, So we'll get that. We'll get that taken care of. But uh, thank you for joining us again. I know you're tired. We'll let you go. And uh, thank you to all the listeners who who piped in and who wrote to us and who said nice things over at the over at the equine network booth we appreciate that as well <laughs> so thank you so much for that uh, allison anything else before we wrap oh just if you want to see recap videos or highlight videos of massachusetts make sure you follow us over at equine affair on facebook instagram twitter and soon tiktok And then, of course, we'll be ramping up with Ohio announcements and Ohio details on social media pretty soon. We're already working on it. Um, And, of course, you can go to equineaffair.com and learn all about the stuff as we get it posted. So make sure you join us. 
Thank you, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. Jamie will be back, and we'll be doing some really bad ads and normal Friday stuff, so join us for that. And, of course, we'll be here as far as next week's schedule is concerned. We'll be around Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday doing shows, and then on uh, Thursday and Friday we'll be off for Thanksgiving here in the United States. And then we always take uh, Black Friday off because, you know, we can. So I have to drop sometime, too. So. (laughs) <laughs> because we can. <laughs> because we can. That's right. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate it.